The one question I wanted to start out with was uh, that the People's Library has sparked a debate in librarianship uh, over what constitutes a library. And uh, how would you define a library in your experience? I would specifically say that a library is a place of community. It's a meeting of minds. It's a place of sharing. It's a place of collaborating and actually coming to engage with your own culture. Does there have to be curation involved? Mm -hmm. uh, oh. I, I think that, you know, I, the two parts that put together a library are the information resources and then some form, I think there should be some curation. I think that it doesn't need to be as formal as we think about it. You know, you look at what we did, and it's much less formal than we think of most libraries. And I think it's possible to still have a library with even less formal organization than we had. Um, you know, I think even just use creates curation. So it's, I, I think it's quite possible to have a li something that could be termed a library that had even less organization and formality than we had. And curation doesn't have to be the structure. It's also yeah. us being there, yeah. being able to interact and answer questions. <laughs> I, I think one thing too is that we often point out is that we are, in, as librarians of the Occupy Wall Street Library, we're also users. So there doesn't need to be that divide between users and the curators and librarians and caretakers. Um, so that's part of what I mean by use creates the curation. It's just, you know, I, I don't think there needs to be that divide. It could be a more even denominated user curated. And it is a curatorial decision to say that we are going to build this collection based on donations. Yeah. You know, that was a decision that wasn't just like, oh, we're just going to take donations and that's mm -hmm. going to be the collection. Like, there was a point at which we had to say, we do have financial resources that we can put towards the library. Are we going to buy books with it? And there was a decision made as a working group that the way this collection has been built, the way this collection is built, or curated, if you would, is by donations. Our collection was curated by the community itself. Now, you all have professional or pre-professional degrees, right? Uh, has, over the course of the occupation, did you have a number of people coming to you with professional degrees who wanted to help out in some way? Do you know about how many people over the... the and, and <laughs> it's, it's also, it's, it's not just library science degrees. I mean, one of the members who was occupying there and sleeping in the park and very active with the library was a tenured university professor in who teaches literature. Mm -hmm. we, have, we had another, you know, tenured university professor. We have a lot of people who are coming in who have advanced degrees in one field or another. It's not all library science, because although we, we saw everyone had a little books. Yeah. And yeah. Learning yeah I, and and part of the learning community. I think it's one of the um, defining demographics of the New Hampshire Library Working Group compared to the rest of occupation um, that kind of sometimes would cause tension or at least I, this, this strange thing between kind of surprising visitors that there were so many advanced degree holding people hanging out at the park and also something that made it very familiar to them kind of like the normal, weirdly normal people. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> <laughs> Speak for yourself. In, well, I, in that um, there was an ordinate, inordinately high number of people who held in advanced degrees, whether they were PhDs or master's degrees, a, a large number of college and graduate students, um, which was kind of an odd, odd thing to see down there. Um, so as we said, we had two tenured, you know, professors on sabbatical. We had undergrad students, um, you know, one guy who's working on an anthropology PhD, and then we'd have a lot of visitors who are also professional librarians and archivists, uh, students in especially the, the library sciences and information sciences from around the city, especially coming to visit us. So now, we now, pe know. excuse me, the People's Library has now morphed a lot into uh, a mobile library, is that right? That's your plans, is it totally mobile now? What are your plans for the future it's in terms of totally mobility? Because we have thousands and thousands yeah. of books. Yeah, so the collection is much too large to have it be mobile. We do mobilize and respond to different actions that are taking place, different direct actions, different, um, protest points, the different things that are going on with the movement at large, and not even our own movement. We had um, representation at some of the Martin Luther King Day experiences. Like We just go out there wherever there's a collection of people and it's kind of spread. I'm hoping to show up at the G8 in NATO in uh -huh. Chicago. Yeah. <laughs> so you have enough materials on hand so that you could do like three simultaneous events. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Certainly. Yes, definitely. Certainly. It, that just then becomes a challenge of logistics. Personal. Logistics. Yeah. You know, carts, the ease of getting that stuff out. I mean, when you have a tent, you can have 4,000 books set up and well-organized 
and it's wonderful and easy, but when you're kind of going from a march to a speak out to something, it's Stop really there. difficult to carry 4,000 books. <laughs> I mean, we've tried, but <laughs> it's just like, at a certain point, like, we think the number's like 3,500, your body just says, no more. <laughs> But also, uh, sorry, that's another place where the curation comes yeah. in, is not only for the, the direct actions and marches, but things like the farm, like the Occupy Farm, where the medics need books, or, you know, the kitchen needs books, so we can go through and select the selection criteria. That was going to be my question, is how do you know what books to select? Is it random, or is it targeted for whatever event that you're going to? It, it varies, um, you know, so... For example, the farm, you sent a book, a bunch of books out of upstate New York that were topical to the work they were doing at the farm. We sent the medics books that applied to the work they do. Um, you know, for for Martin Luther King Day, I think we tried to pick some books that were topical to that. But if there's a, a large kind of general occupation action, we'll load up two carts, one full of fiction and one full of nonfiction, and try to have a, a representation of what's in the collection as a whole so that it uh, does actually... Uh, function as a general lending library like we had when we were stationary. We also, there, it, you know, people in the occupation would periodically say, we're this group and we're requesting some books on this topic, so as you see them, can you pull them? And even, you know, just having a list of people would put their name and be like, George is looking for a copy of The Road. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you can pull it and set it aside, and then when you see George, you go, here! Yeah, or even genres. I did my first reader's advisory <laughs> when I was there at the park, and I was all excited about it. We also had a satellite collection when we were at the park of spirituality materials that were by the Tree of Life, which was the, the spirituality section of the park. So, I mean, we support we support um, things topically as, as best we can and when it's appropriate to do so. And you also had a reference collection. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, now that was for practical information questions, uh, like uh, for emergency numbers and things it, like that. It, well, how did, what did it represent? It, was, it represented those books that were in such high demand by people. We felt that once we got a copy that we could actually hold on to, we would mark it reference so that it wouldn't travel too far from the library. Things like Howard Zinn's People's History of the United Citizens States. Citizens United was, mm -hmm. was in our reference collection. There was a lot, though. There was the Onion. Remember the Onion books there? The <laughs> there, was, like, there was a there, real there mixture. Were, there were two two kind of sections of it. One were the things we look at as general weapons materials, dictionaries and things like that, that you would prefer to, um, like you would in any library. But then there was also the, the books in highest demand that we thought were central idea books that um, really supported it, that we wanted to always be available instead of wondering, oh, do we have a copy today? Did someone borrow it and not bring it back yet? So that if someone came and said, hey, I want to read this, we'd say, we always have a copy, but you have to read it here. Please don't take it so that we can make sure that it's always available. What were those two uh, reference books that you were able to retrieve? We recovered You Can't Be Neutral on a Moving Train by <laughs> Howard Zinn and a moderately usable dictionary. It's it's damaged, but it's you can still use it. Just not if you need to find something in A. <laughs> Who needs the A? Twenty five letter alphabet. But it, uh, to add to the reference collection, um, we also then had books where people would donate some books and specifically say, "I am donating this book for the reference collection," yeah. mm -hmm. and we would try and respect that certainly, and also. The reference collection contained a lot of books which had been donated by the authors, with in, which were yeah. signed with like notes to the movement in them. Mm -hmm. And while some of those came from people like, you know, Chris Hedges, whose books were in the reference collection also because they were topical and in high demand, there was also fiction and people's you know self-published poetry collection that were in the reference collection because you know once it has that inscription to the movement, it you know it, it, it gains kind of an archival value on top of. It. It's just in what ways are you preserving the history of the movements? I mean, you you, you take stuff back to the living room, right? A lot. <laughs> That's one way of doing it. But you're also working with uh, New York University or some other places well, that are. The archive working 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 group. With the, oh, it's the, a separate group. That we yeah. talk with them, um, and some of you know, as as you said, some of us are archivists, so we try to. Help them because um, it seems like they've got a lot of archive students who are kind of looking at it from a, an educational perspective as well. Um, 
but you know, as, as we can say, we did lose a lot of our archive materials when uh, the city came and took everything, and we didn't get those back. Um, so we're we're doing it as best we can, and um, I think at some point there will be a point when we sit down and do kind of more formal archive work and order it and describe the collection, but that's not a thing that's happening yet. It's there really is a lot of ephemera. Um, there is. Yeah. Yeah. The stuff handed out in marches, um, flyers that people hand out, um, you know, memos, just there's all kinds of, of ephemera floating around that needs to be preserved and that needs to be taken care of. Um, and I think the archives are working very good working with it, so yeah, we make there's... sure that that happens. There are other organizations that have come down and expressed their own interest. I know that Tamarin came down. Mm -hmm. Smithsonian. Smithsonian, Smithsonian was there. Smithsonian was there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we're taking this time. Yeah. You would kind of see people just surreptitiously walking off yeah. with yeah. pieces of our history. Yeah. But, but I mean, ultimately, a, a lot of that stuff, you know, they're like, oh, they took that great sign, but sometimes that means that it survived. Yeah. You know? mm -hmm. At this point, a lot of the archives an archival material that is surviving, we're lucky that people who were concerned were like, I am going to start building this collection yeah. in my apartment, and then when the full collection call goes out, I'm going to donate it back. But it means that, you know, I've got a box of stuff in my apartment which didn't disappear in the raid, because... And we also have a small problem of the, some of the stuff that we did get back from the raid, including destroyed books, are not in very good condition and we don't currently have the, the resources to take care of that. Um, so when when everything from the park was tossed in the dump trucks, it was all just tossed in together. So kitchen and library were tossed in the same dump truck. Uh, so some of the books that at, right at the moment we are holding on to um, as possible court evidence, they smell. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they stink. And they're not getting better, they're getting worse. They're, you know, I smelled a book one day and it smelled like gasoline. And one of the other librarians smelled another one and said it smelled like shrimp. And so we kind of <laughs> <laughs> We have this problem, um, this preservation problem already, even though we haven't even approached the, the actual archives work. And you know, we have things like, you know, one day the cops tried to kettle in a bunch of occupiers and we took their orange kettles away from them and turned them into signs. <laughs> And we yeah. covered some of those signs too. And you know, how do you pervert? I don't think this has ever been a problem that an archivist has dealt with trying yeah. to preserve the correct way to preserve a, a, a sign yeah. made out of orange netting it's and duct tape. Yeah, kind of brittle. Yeah. yeah. And some of them are just meaningful. Like I have the destroyed copy of Fahrenheit 451 that was thrown in the garbage, yeah. which was like impactful, just what it is. Yeah. Now you mentioned uh, potential court actions or court mm -hmm. evidence. In what ways are you pursuing legal action against New York City, or what court actions are you talking about? We, we, don't, we can't really say yet. Um, we do have... Um... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, no, we have a really wonderful lawyer working for us, um, Norm, 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 Norman Siegel, who is the former head of New York Civil Liberties Union, is, is doing it for us, um, and we're not... We, uh, we don't even know exactly what it's going to look like quite yet, so we couldn't even tell you because we don't necessarily know, um, aside from it not being the best idea to tell you. <laughs> but, um, yes, yes, there, yeah. we are pursuing legal action against the city <laughs> and the like, mayor and the police department. Yeah. As soon as we know and, and Norm says we can tell everyone, we will most certainly tell the community. In what ways are you cooperating and perhaps advising with other Occupy libraries across the United States and Madrid and elsewhere? Working on it. Working on yeah, it. Yeah, I feel that our very existence, actually, just the premise of what it is that we do, the fact that you can access everything and really kind of reference all the work that we've done online, because we do, we are so careful about getting everything up there on the blog so that people can see it and it can serve as a as a working model to kind of like draw inspiration from and draw ideas and failures and see how things are working and not working and kind of build up from there. But we we try to be as communicative as possible. We actually send books to other occupations. Um, I think most of us have visited at least a few other occupations and both dropped off a box of books and sat down in the library and chatted with the people there um, to see how things were going from them so that we can learn from each other. Uh, there's also, there are plans in the works to do bus tours. Um, and I think some of us are going to try to participate in that so that um, various occupiers from all different working groups will travel around to different communities, visit their occupations, um, and, and chat with them and see what we can do to help support them and what they can do to help work with us. 
That sounds like I'll have to wait till the summer, I suppose. Yes. <laughs> and we've also had visitors, you know, especially I recall uh, Occupy Hartford's like their librarian and we had a visitor from Nashville. Um, and I personally would love to see a very large book launch in Chicago. Yes. Mm-hmm. So, uh, all you librarians out there, Chicago this yes. May, yeah. bring your books. It's going to be awesome. <laughs> You had mentioned the consortium. Too. Yeah, we're, we're building it. We're connecting people up. It's a lot of the camps have been destroyed, so people are scattered, and we're just trying to connect, first of all, and then try to learn from each other. Because what's happening in Vancouver, Vancouver's doing amazing things. And actually, we need to talk to some of them. <laughs> I mean, they already have partnerships with bookstores, and they have a physical space. In London, they have multiple branches. And they haven't had a problem with space. So we're connecting everyone up to talk to each other. And more formal, established libraries have reached out because they, um, the circulation director at Columbia University had emailed us at one point in time. Mm-hmm. So, one last question I think. You, you uh, have a lot of information on your blog about the, um, the, the poetry anthology. What's the ultimate goal of the poetry anthology uh, publication? Is it an ongoing process? It is an ongoing process. That one of our working group members actually it's his his baby. He owns it. Um, as public. far as you can own something, <laughs> yeah, yeah. 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 You'd really have to ask him. He's not here. Um, yeah, I, I think the process is. You know, I don't think there's an ultimate goal per se. I think the process is. Yeah, is the goal. Yeah, mm-hmm. but it becomes another kind of example of an interesting living archival document mm-hmm. where. These are poems that people were writing, in many cases, not all certainly, but about the movement or as they were participating in the movement. So beyond just being a collection of wonderful poetry, it has you know archival value and historical value. Um, and I mean, I think, and I reserve the right to be wrong on this, but I think that it keeps being reposted yeah, to the blog yeah. right, as right, a right. full PDF, which is downloadable from the blog. Um, and technically speaking, then you could print it, but I think it's hundreds and hundreds. It's it's a big art. Yeah. It's a big book. Well, I actually have one last question, probably, unless you have another one. Um, is, you know, you mentioned that there's a lot of people out there that just sit around, do nothing, and just sign a petition, and that's all, but many librarians are constrained by what they can do, either by time and space or by their own inability to speak outside their own organization. What can people do that is still radical enough to make a difference who can't make it to an Occupy Zone? Well, I have two small children. Um, I have a full-time job, and I managed to make it to an occupation, and I managed to stay there for a long time. I think that if you accept that this is incredibly, crucially important, um, you can find a way to join actions that are going on near you. I mean, you don't have to go out and sleep at a park, but, I mean, I live in a small town in Indiana, and even where I live, there are actions going on around me. Um, I think once you get past that initial, it's scary to join an action, and what do you do when you go to a protest, and what do you wear to a protest, and what do you do with the kids? Once you sort through all of that, and you just go out and do it, you can see that it's not scary. It's not intimidating. Um... And I, I really think that that's where people should start, is just, just get out there. If, if I can do it, um, you know, and when the ones that I've gone to in D.C., I've gone with a three-year-old on my hip, um, then they can do it, too. It's not that bad. Right. It's really not. I mean, I'm a PTO mom, and I do it. So surely they can do it, too. I think something also that librarians specifically can do if they feel constrained and all those things is really just pay attention to their collections and make sure that their collections mm-hmm. have the breadth to actually cover these viewpoints and these ideas and all of these things. Um, I mean, I think that the ultimate subversive act is to hand someone a book. So mm-hmm. by like doing that in their collection development policies and making sure that they're actually covering all of these things and making sure that the ideas are there and that, that piece of the American soul that makes you want to go out there and protests that actually exist within their collections, that it, it, that's something that they, they can do. And, and, and circulation-wise, yeah. also, if a book is prominently displayed, people read it. Mm-hmm. And not everything that you do as a protest librarian ends you up sitting at ALA. Yeah. <laughs> you have to be put on the internet with your names and, you know, yeah. all that stuff. There are things that you can do that let you fly under the radar. You know, you could 
be the person who answers the email and not have your name attached to the email that you answer it from. You can build a blog or, you know, you could go down in the middle of the night to an occupation and drop off breakfast. It, there are things that you can do that, you know, won't get you noticed in the rest of your life. And on the flip side of that is that this stuff is important, so maybe you should take those risks. Nothing... There are other you know, ways to get involved without getting... Not everyone can do that, but maybe you should risk that a little bit because, you know, we've got people out here who are homeless and working in our library and traveled up from the South and are living on the streets of New York City in January. You can maybe get yelled at by your... You can get involved in tertiary experiences, though, too. Like, to go off something you said earlier about other librarians getting involved with what we're doing, you can get involved with... Urban Libraries Unite and Radical Reference and all of these other people who, who get involved, but they're not direct action involved. They're involved in supportive roles. I would also remind at least my academic library colleagues that the American, American Association of University Professors has a statement on academic freedom for librarians. Um, many, if not most of our institutions, you know, say that they support those principles. So this is an academic freedom issue. Um, if it becomes an issue in your job, this is a reasonable sort of, it's both a professional activity um, and it's also a political activity. And that's pretty clearly protected if people are worried about getting fired. Um, I think that there are documents out there that are meant to ensure that that doesn't happen to them. I think there's a lot to be said just on kind of a very simple level of just talking to the people around you. You know, letting people around you know, these things are happening in the world, and I have an opinion on them. This matters. This is why I think it is. I think that the problem with so much of, you know, commenting on the internet, for example, is that you're just firing words off into this void where everybody is faceless. But when you actually stand across from somebody who you work with or you know with, and or you know, and you say, this is important, this is why, and just voice your opinion and force yourself to voice your opinion. I think that that is, like, a really important first step. Or to form an opinion. Or to yeah, form an opinion. opinion. Yes, you and, get one of those. And the other, <laughs> yeah, the other thing that I would say is, in terms of the way things currently are in libraries and elsewhere, so if you think that right now things aren't so bad that you actually need to stand up and do something about it, ask yourself, so what's my threshold? Is it when my library gets shut two days a week, then am I going to protest? Or is it when somebody in my family, you know, gets kicked out of their home? And if you're going to set a point on that, you know, list and it hasn't happened yet, okay, different people arrive at different conclusions at different moments, and that needs to be respected. But when you reach that point, we'll be waiting for you. 